many drugs have been pulled from the market with much weaker data than uh, yes. what's out there for, for some of these risks. We're going to be discussing a study that found no adverse outcomes associated with the use of hormonal contraception. And they took a look at 58 different meta-analyses, so big studies, uh, concerning hormonal contraceptive use and found after looking through all of those studies that there were no adverse health outcomes. We took a look at that conclusion and thought there might be something a little bit fishy there. And we're here to talk with Dr. Bill Williams, Dr. Joel Brand, and Dr. Kathleen Raviel. My guess is that they reached the conclusion that they did before they even started to write the paper. Right away, you know that the title is misleading. The title should have said, talked about the risk of combination oral contraceptives, estrogen, progestin containing oral contraceptive pills, because those are the only ones that they say themselves have, have given them any clinically meaningful data. They've done here what, what's called an umbrella study. What's interesting is the criteria they use to arrive at their conclusions, which shows you that they're, what they're trying to do, unlike what the methodology of epidemiology is supposed to do, to increase the sensitivity, get rid of the noise, increase the sensitivity so that our observations are more precise, more reliable, more robust. No, what they did here is they moved the goalpost, as you might say in a football analogy, so that um, you cannot uh, find any, you, you define down what a statistical result means. Uh, the way I would, I might, would describe it as a, as a scientist is you have a microscope and you have, your microscope can be focused on low power, medium power, high power, where you have much more uh, sharper view, much more sensitivity, you zoom in. And what they're doing here is they're zooming out. So they basically took an established precedent of 95% being right. um, kind of arbitrarily no longer good enough. Right. Is that right. correct? And yes, it's no longer good enough. And in fact, now remember, we're still C grade, you know, suggestive. So that for that, you need a P value of 10 to the minus three. That means 95% isn't good enough. You need 99.9 .9 to be called suggestive. Mm. This, is, this is already, you know, totally off the rails, but we still have, we still have highly suggestive for highly suggestive P less than 10 to the minus six. We don't need 95%. We don't need 99%. We need 99.9999% certainly. Mm -hmm. this and is again, that's to be sure that the, the results that you've gotten in your study are not due to chance, correct? Right. Yes. It, it, there are all, all kinds of pitfalls in epidemiology, and there are valid statistical methods to weed them out. They they pick and choose where they apply this newfound uh, yes, uh, they affinity do. for they, rigor. Yeah, there's a section, usually formally when you write a paper, you, there's a section called discussion. You have the mm -hmm. materials, what, what you're doing, you know, the introduction, the materials and methods, and then you have the results, and then you have the discussion. Discussion is is in, in this kind of paper is where you go into the massage parlor. That, oh, well, they'll they'll pick this study because they want to prove wow. this point in this paper this way. And it's right. these days, everybody talks about following the science. What I hate to tell you is that the scientists are not following the science. And one of the things that you learn in clinical research is that it's absolutely critical when you're studying healthy, normal volunteers that you introduce minimal to no risk to these volunteers. Now, I think this is very analogous to the situation with hormonal contraception. Their safety profile has to be as clean as a whistle, in my mind, to, for it to be even ethical to prescribe them. Uh, let's talk about some of the diseases that we found associations with. Breast yes. cancer, cervical, cervical cancer, Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory bowel disease, which is chronic. It's a lifelong uh, battle for these patients that have it. Same with ulcerative colitis. Systemic lupus, my training is rheumatology. These patients have a lifelong uh, debilitating disease, which is often very, very life-threatening. Not to mention depression, 
uh, which of course is very, very prevalent in our society. Uh, and that leads to actually increasing suicide risk, which you know, we didn't cover in the meta-analysis, but you know, uh, now it's been known for a while that the progestin only ones have caused osteoporosis and they admit that in the prescribing information. But the evidence is now clear that it's not just getting your bones softer, but actually fractures, bone fractures yes. are increased. Not to mention the things that actually are acknowledged to some extent, like myocardial infarction and supervascular accident. In other words, heart attacks and strokes. That's acknowledged in the labeling. But it, what we found is that it's very misleading because we know that it's compounded by smoking status and age. And so the way they have the tables laid out in the prescribing information, it makes it look like the risk is from the smoking and from the age and that the contraceptive just adds a little bit to it. That's a complete fabrication and massaging of the data. But think about this, you know, what uh, kind of risk are you willing to take to um, set yourself up potentially for one of these diseases? Would a 50% increase in risk, you know, kind of put you off or 50% certainty rather that you would have an increased risk put you off from it? or 75% increase. Well, certainly 95% increased risk, I would think would, you know, set the bells off in other healthy uh, individuals. But here they're saying, as Joel said, that it has to be 99.9% .9 to even be weak evidence. Um, many drugs have been pulled from the market with much weaker data than uh, yes. what's out there for, for some of these risks. And I do want to circle back to the DMPA, uh, Depo-Provera, basically. Uh, this has been shown to increase the risk uh, of transmission of HIV to women. And it appears to be unique just for Depo-Provera. Right. So if somebody is compelled to use hormonal contraceptives for some reason, definitely should not use that one because it has, in addition to the other risks, it has this additional unique risk to you know, introduce HIV infection, which is obviously a very, very severe and preventable yes. thing. And for anyone who's interested in, in looking at the petition and even commenting on it, which last I checked, I checked this morning, we have over 159 comments on the petition. It's on a publicly available government website. You can view it yourself. You can comment it on it yourself. Um, and it's uh, we have links to it on the Natural Womanhood uh, website and articles about it, condensing the information in it. Whenever we talk about the risks of birth control, we get pushback from women who have been put on it because of painful periods. Um, you know, oftentimes associated with things like endometriosis and uh, polycystic ovary sy syndrome (PCOS), and they're told that there's nothing better for them. And they do experience some relief on these hormonal birth control methods um, from, you know, these periods and, and, and pain that was very disruptive to their life. And we don't want to minimize what they were feeling before going on birth control. But what we take issue with at Natural Womanhood is them being told that that's their only option. And that, in fact, is their best option. Um, and being told that birth control is in a way therapeutic for them, which we know that it's not, that it actually just gets rid of your menstrual cycle, essentially, so that you no longer have issues with your menstrual cycle. For 17 years, I did prescribe birth control pills and probably a third of an OBGYN's day and probably a lot of a family practice doctor's day and a pediatrician's day is take managing complications from the pill adverse reactions to the pill, uh, particularly more acne when they were put on the pill, uh, abnormal bleeding when they were put on the pill for abnormal bleeding, uh, breast lumps, which cause great concern and require biopsies and mammograms and ultrasounds. Well, I remember being called to the emergency room one night to see a patient who was not my patient. And um, she was in the emergency room with the GYN problem, but in eliciting her history, she had just been discharged from the hospital with a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. She was 32 years old and she was on birth control pills. And I said, you need to get off the pill because this caused your heart attack. And she said, no, 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 
oh, the cardiologist told me it had nothing to do with birth control pills. And, you know, it's this type, this type of study that it's in JAMA reassures the doctor, no, there aren't any side effects with the pills. So when you see a woman who actually has a real problem, it's not from the pill. It's, it's something else, or it was just a fluke. And this JAMA study actually contradicts the World Health Organization, which had already declared in 2005, based on their research and studying all the studies on pills, that these drugs were group one carcinogens in the same category as asbestos. All the studies on the thromboembolic phenomenon with birth control pills are not in the OBGYN literature. They're in the hematology literature, they're in the pulmonary literature, they're in the cardiology literature. So OBGYNs don't see wow. those studies. They're never quoted. And wow. uh, the ortho ever patch was shown to have an even higher risk of blood clots. And I remember the letter I got from ortho, I wasn't prescribing pills at the time, but they sent it to everybody in the American College of OBGYN showing you how you could explain to patients how they really didn't have to come off the patch, that this really wasn't a serious problem for them. So it was, again, manipulating wow. the doctor to just continue prescribing it. When you look at the literature, uh, before this so-called umbrella analysis came out, when you look at the literature, the data has always been considered quite convincing of the elevated risk for deep vein thrombosis. Yes. So what do they say in this paper? Oh, they have to address that, don't they? Everybody knows knows that it causes that. So here's what they say right in the abstract. The risk of thromboembolism among them, those using versus not using oral contraceptive was an odds ratio of 2.42, which means 142% risk increase and definitely uh, statistically significant. Well, so what did they do? They say that was initially supported by highly suggestive evidence, not convincing, highly suggestive evidence, but this evidence was downgraded to weak in the sensitivity analysis. See, they invent this <laughs> sensitivity analysis to take even things that everybody knows, everybody who's familiar with the risk profile of these drugs uh, knows about. And they say, oh, no, no, even that, when you, when you use the modern, you know, super duper epidemiological statistical methodology, uh, to analyze it, you see, nah, it's weak. It's really weak. 142% increased risk. Nah, that doesn't mean anything. But it does mean, like so many patients, what Dr. Reviel was talking about. I'm a scientist. My aim is always to find out exactly what's going on at the molecular level. It's not just statistical. Mm -hmm. What's actually going on? And the fact is, we know what's going on. We know how, how these things cause blood clots. We know why the patch is worse than the pill. We know, we know exactly why uh, Depo increases the risk of uh, HIV transmission and why the other uh, contraceptives don't. So it's not even just a matter of battling statistics. Well, our statistical model is better than you. No, no, no. We, we actually do bench science with uh, cell culture situations and in vitro and animal studies and all of this. These, these uh, side effects, these devastating negative effects of these pills, and I, I don't even like to call them hormones because they're not really hormones. They're yeah. hormone agonist drugs. They're synthet synthetic drugs that act like hormones. Yeah. But uh, we know why, why they do what they do. And I think uh, a, a point to make uh, in all of this is that birth control, it's pretty clear from what each one of you have, have talked about in kind of the different parts of this discussion, birth control does not just affect um, a woman's fertility. It, it clearly affects a lot of different parts of her body. Um, it's not just preventing you from getting pregnant. You know, we've talked about autoimmune disorders. We've talked about breast cancer. We've talked about blood clots. We've talked about depression. We have hit every major bodily system. This study, this JAMA study, if you call, want to call it a study, actually exemplifies the complete turnaround, the complete perversion of the science of epidemiology. It used to be back in the 60s when, when, when that field was in its infancy. Uh -huh. uh, it, it was, it tried, it was in support of the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle saying, if you find even one study that shows that there is significant harm from something. 
then you should not market it. It should be it should be unlawful. And that's become completely turned around in order to serve the agenda of those who, who want to make these, these dangerous drugs, um, who want to continue to have them available to as many people as possible. I thank you so much, all three of you, for participating in this with us, Dr. Williams, Dr. Brand, Dr. Raviel. Um, thank you for working you know, tirelessly to get the right information into the hands of women so that they can make decisions for themselves. Thank you.